message is the question of, of divorce, and it remains uh, a controversial subject in the church today. Uh, and, and the reason it is, is because basically the, the church has kind of mimicked society. Uh, if you go back 20 years ago, there was a lot of stigma when it came to divorce, because that's what society said. Uh, you know, currently there's there's still that in, in, uh, in some churches uh, around, uh, around the country. Uh, a lot of churches are a lot more gracious you know, to people that have been divorced and remarried and so forth, and we thank God for that. But I still don't think it's because they know what the Bible says. I think it's just because society has changed and has become more gracious because it's more common, it's more, it's more prevalent. There's probably nobody here that hasn't been impacted either through our own lives, our parents, a brother, a sister, our kids, or good friends that have gone through divorce and we know that uh, how difficult it is. So it's, it's a controversial subject, but what we're going to try to do is just walk through what Jesus says about it uh, this morning. And uh, I think that, uh, I hope it's enlightening. I hope we kind of get to the truth of the thing uh, and be able to, um, uh, uh, what I hope will be uh, something that will uh, minister to you. When we were in Matthew 5, we talked about, uh, there, uh, the subject came up again. And, uh, and we talked about uh, the misconception of uh, a marriage in our own country that says one out of two marriages end in divorce. And we talked about how skewed those statistics are because they're, uh, what they do is they take all the number of marriages and all the number of divorces and, uh, and one out of two end in divorce. But what they don't tell you is that you have a subculture of people uh, that get divorced over and over and over and over and if you take all those guys out of that, then the, uh, the number of people staying married is, is far greater than that. Most people that get married stay married, but you don't really hear that through the media, and I think for an intended reason, because it's, it's not a popular concept with the, our culture these days, the idea of the permanence of, of marriage, but certainly that's a, at the heart of what we want to look at. In fact, the statistic is if you get a divorce, three out of four people that get a divorce get another one and another one, three out of four. So there is this whole little subculture. Uh, now, it's interesting as we look at the culture of Jesus's day, where it come from, uh, from the, the law of Moses and so forth, we're going to find a lot, of, a lot of commonality between what's going on in the world today, people's views of, of this subject and marriage, and what was being reflected at the time of Jesus. At the time of Jesus, divorce was considered a virtue, a virtue. You were a righteous person if you got a divorce. Why? Because they believed, misinterpreting what Moses says in Deuteronomy 24, and we'll read that in a moment, they believed, they, they would say, and they'll say to Jesus, uh, but didn't Moses command that you get a divorce? That's really what they thought, what they believed. So in the Torah, of the law of God, it commanded you to get a divorce if your wife was uh, not pleasing to you in some way. And we'll talk about the specifics of what Moses said. But if, if God commanded you to do that and you did it, then you did the right thing. You did a righteous thing. They absolutely believed that if you did it, then you were not obeying the law of God. So it wasn't that way through his, historically through Judaism. We think about Judaism being very pro-marriage, uh, very pro-family, which it was historically. But by the time you get to the days of Jesus in the first century, uh, it was at one of the, the worst times uh, of Judaism, according to their own historians. Tremendous immorality. And we've talked about uh, the corruption within Caiaphas and within the uh, Sanhedrin and the leadership over, over the country. But in Jesus' day, it was considered a, a, a virtue, and I'll read you a couple of a quotes from a few rabbis to illustrate that in a, in a moment. Uh, and again, 
And then in our own society, we've got, uh, in our own church, we've got lots of folks that have, uh, no show of hands, we've got lots of folks that have been divorced and are still single, divorced and been remarried, some that are in process, some that are still suffering from it. Um, uh, again, from uh, just to lay a few uh, ground rules out that, um, uh, and again, you can tell this is uh, not one of those uh, opening with a wonderful emotional illustration that really draws you in. This, this is a lot of information. Uh, and actually, we want to kind of put our thinking caps on and make sure we've got it straight because there's a lot of people that I'll just tell you, they misunderstand the whole concept and really don't know what the Bible says uh, about it. Uh, and I think it hurts people today, unfor unfortunately. When we were in Matthew 5, when we covered this, the one thing that we saw and we tried to make clear is that divorce is not a sin. It is never mentioned as a sin in the Bible. You can't find it as a sin anywhere in the Bible. It's taught in a lot of churches that it's a sin. It's not a sin. In fact, we're going to see, by, based on what Jesus says, that actually, if you, if you, the one provision he gives for divorce, if you follow it, that is considered a righteous divorce. We, we don't even look at it. <laughs> we don't even think that that's, that's possible. But I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of that. Uh, the second thing, uh, again, is that uh, uh, what Jesus is concerned about is our hearts more than anything else. And we saw that in Matthew 5. It's the reason why. Uh, and, uh, and so that will become important for us to keep our eye on as well. Let's go ahead and jump into our text. And the first thing we're going to see is that Jesus is tested by the Pharisees for the purpose uh, of entrapping him. And that's in verses 1 to 3. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Uh, and again, the, the first thing we know about this is the Pharisees are seeking to entrap Jesus because he now traveled to Judea. He's left Galilee for the last time. He's really on his way to the cross, we might say. Geographically, he's traveled from the north, south, going down into what we'd consider the heart of, of Israel, Samaria. He's crossed over to the east side of the Jordan River, and he is once again under the jurisdiction or in the arid, uh, area of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, he was in that area before, made a few interesting comments about Herod, and then he left. The concern, remember, is that this is the guy that beheaded John the Baptist. Why did he behead John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist said he had wrongfully divorced his wife and remarried and was committing adultery. And, uh, and remember, Herod thought that perhaps Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead. And, uh, and, and Jesus needed to leave that area because really of, of a sense of a death threat from Herod. Now he's back in that area again. It's a little dicey. What's the question they come and ask him? What does the law say about divorce? Because whatever you say, you're going to end up on the wrong side of this. Either we're going to be able to prove once and for all that you're not the Messiah or you're going to say what we think you're going to say, and we're going to go right to Herod and say, this guy is accusing you of the same thing as John the Baptist. Either way, it's a win-win for them. So this whole thing is all about entrapping Jesus. He's there once again, notice healing everyone uh, uh, and so forth. These guys are tremendously jealous. Uh, they have really already written Jesus off, and we've already had an official pronouncement on their part by an official delegation from Jerusalem that he is not the Messiah. In fact, what he does, he does by the power of Beelzebub. It's what we refer to as the unpardonable sin, the rejection of Jesus uh, as the Messiah. Uh, and again, secondly, uh, the Pharisees seek to entrap him by the question uh, of divorce in particular. Now, again, it was a virtue in that day. Let me read uh, a quote from John MacArthur's commentary on Matthew. And he says this uh, of that time. One rabbi in the Talmud wrote, for example, a bad wife is like leprosy to her husband. What is the remedy? Let him divorce her and be cured of his leprosy. Another rabbi wrote, if a man has a bad wife, it is his religious duty to divorce her. It's a little interesting there, a little different. You understand why when the, these guys come to Jesus, is it lawful according to Moses? Didn't Moses command us to divorce our wives for any and every reason? Well, let's look at the text 
is back in Matthew, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 24, the first four verses, and then we'll, we'll make a couple of observations about it. Uh, there in verse 1, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing, key term, to him because, and here's really uh, the, the crux of the whole thing, he finds something indecent about her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house and becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she's been defiled. Uh, a couple of things that are interesting here. One is that if you were going to divorce your, your wife, you better think twice about it because you're not going to get her back again. Once you do it, it's done, uh, that's it. So that, that was meant to be there intentionally for that reason, to try to get a guy to think twice about, about doing this. And then secondly, uh, he just couldn't say it verbally. He actually had to track down a scribe, an attorney, <laughs> and have the, a document, a legal document drawn up. It had to be presented. He had to give it to her and so forth. So that may be held off, maybe uh, divorce in the heat of an argument. If it's going to be that easy to come by, let's try to slow down the process a little bit. Uh, if, you, if you do this, uh, you'll never get her back again, ever. Uh, and, and if you do this, there's some steps you've got to walk through to, uh, to make it possible. But notice, uh, in fact, that once that happens, she, she's free to marry again. And what's her husband called? An adulterer? No, he's called her husband. So there, there is freedom for remarriage under the Mosaic law uh, that we see here. By the time Jesus comes along in the first century in this question, this argument, there's two main schools of thought. And, um, and I don't know if you've, you've heard both of these names before, but there was Rabbi Hillel and Shammai. And uh, Shammai's position was the fact that uh, he believed that this idea, the question of uh, what does it really mean, some indecent thing in her, and it's going to state it differently in different translations, but that's what it says in the NIV, something indecent in her. What does that mean? And Shammai taught that meant that she had been uh, sexually unfaithful, that it was a sexual sin, it's adultery, that's what we're talking about. So Shammai held to the view, we might call it the conservative view, that uh, if there's been marital unfaithfulness, uh, then that's, that's the real grounds for divorce. That's what Moses is talking about. And then there's the, the position of, of Rabbi Halal. And these guys are famous. They're, they're tremendous teachers, very famous within, within Judaism. Uh, and um, Halal, sometimes I, I say that Halal liberal, that's how I remember his is more the liberal view. And because I, 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 sometimes you get the names backwards here if, eh, with the positions confused. Now, I, I say that, but I, but I need to say this. He was not liberal. He was not liberal. He was very conservative also. He held to the inerrancy or word of God. He was a righteous man and, uh, and a very famous rabbi within Judaism. Sometimes uh, you hear that, well, he was the liberal guy. Well, you can kind of say that to remember his position. He was not liberal though. So how does he arrive at this position? I, I don't want to say it's, it's through the obvious way of the study of God's word. Now, remember... Shammai's position is that if there's been marital unfaithfulness, you write a certificate of divorce. That's the grounds of divorce. That can't be true according to the word of God. If somebody was sexually unfaithful, if there was adultery, what did the law command happen to that person? They were stoned. So they're supposed to write a certificate of hold that way we kill you. <laughs> so so uh, Halal said that uh, one thing I know for sure is that whatever Moses meant by that, it, it wasn't adultery. Because we already, there's a remedy in the law for dealing with that. And the reason that it was there is because once they died, now that other person was free to marry. Because death, until death do us part, death ended, ended the whole thing. So Halal's position was whatever Moses meant, it wasn't that. Because we have a remedy for that in the law. So it has to be something other than that. So then the question, what is it? And it gets all the way to, she burns your toast on a regular basis. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That's actually uh, almost, that's what some guys divorce their wives from. So divorce is, is, um, is because of this, in this phrase, it's, uh, it, and because it's seen as a, as a virtue, it's rampant in, in, the, in Jesus' day. 
uh, divorce was very, very common because they saw that and really because of the position of halal. It's not because of sexual uh, uh, adultery because that ends in death. So therefore, what he means by something indecent has to be what we would call today irreconcilable differences. There's some kind of, why do people get divorced today? Irreconcilable differences. Do, do many marriages have that? They all have it, sometimes every day, just so you're straight on that. If you think that's the grounds for divorce, you're, we're, we're all in trouble because that kind of happens several times a day sometimes. We have some irreconcilable difference. We just have to figure it out and, uh, and, and work it out. You could see why if you accepted that position like they did, divorce would be rampant. Uh, and uh, it, it is to a large degree. It's not as bad as the media would say it is, but it certainly, it's certainly, it's bad and, and it's difficult. So again, uh, based on, on what Halal said, actually, which I probably think is probably the correct view, uh, it's based on the law, it's, man, it's like, okay, what does it mean by that? And then you get to the point where the rabbis interpret it, the Pharisees in particular, by the time of Jesus comes along, that uh, it's a virtue because God commanded, if there's something indecent, if God commanded it, you do it. And if you do it, then you've obeyed the law and you're a virtuous person. Now, Jesus, that's what the question is. Why did Moses command this? Of course, Jesus comes back and says, says no, he permitted it. He didn't command it. He permitted it. These guys sound like reporters from CNN <laughs> misquoting the facts here. But he didn't. He, <laughs> Moses never commanded anything. He just says, and Jesus straightens them out and says he, he permitted it. In terms of why was it so radical that, that there would be stoning or death uh, at, because of uh, sexual immorality? Well, again, it was an example to warn. It was an example to warn because uh, that, don't you think I would like cut, cut down on it just a little bit if, uh, if somebody committed sexual <laughs> immorality? That would just kind of really uh, change, the, change the playing field there a little bit. Uh, you know, when you, uh, when you fly in, and arrive in, in Singapore, and I've been there through that airport a couple of times. Big signs, red and white letters uh, everywhere. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, if you have drugs in Singapore, you're executed. And so when you're, when, that kind of, they, have, they don't have a big drug problem there. Uh, so as you're, you're at the airport, this big sign saying, if you have illegal drugs on you, here's the amnesty bin, drop them off now. If you go by this point, and there's signs warning you repeatedly, and they tell you on the airport, I uh, mean, on the plane as you arrive, if you go beyond that point and you're caught, you're going to be executed. Not, not a big drug problem there. It's very harsh, but there's not a big drug problem. So within, within Judaism, under the law of Moses, again, it was to try to eliminate this thing that destroys people's lives, that destroys marriages, it destroys families, uh, it destroys uh, the, the, really the fabric of our society as a result. So it was very, it was very harsh uh, under the Mosaic law. And then secondly, it goes along with that, God did that because to preserve the nation of Israel to try to preserve this, this tribe, nation, group of people through whom the Messiah would come. And so it is, it's very harsh. And the third reason they did it, I've already mentioned, is because it, it uh, then left the other party, the innocent party, free to, uh, to marry again. So God permitted, we see right here in Deuteronomy 24, uh, again, the permission to go on and, uh, and marry once again. So the, the, their question is, uh, is it lawful or do, uh, to divorce for any and every reason is meant to entrap Jesus. They're, they're, it's for that purpose. Now Jesus comes back in a, a typical <coughs> Jewish argument. He doesn't answer their questions. He gives them a question, which is uh, very, very typical. And uh, so in verses four to six, Jesus gives us God's original principles for marriage. You're concerned about divorce. You're concerned about when is divorce okay? Any and every reason? That's not the issue. The issue is how do we stay married? <laughs> this is really what, where Jesus is uh, getting at. And he says in verse four, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. So the first thing we notice is that um, 
the original principles are not found in Deuteronomy. Jesus goes all the way back to, to Genesis. Uh, and again, he teaches what God positively had in mind for men and women when they come together in marriage. And uh, why go back to Genesis? Because if we go back there and see God's plan, God's ideal, then divorce is really not even in the vocabulary. It's, it's not there. It's, it's really meant to be permanent, which is why when the disciples hear this teaching, and they are very part of the culture they're in that believes that you can get divorced anytime you want for irreconcilable differences, and they hear this teaching on, on the permanence of marriage, they go, well, <laughs> who's going to get married then? There's a lot of people that ask that question, right? If what you're saying is true, you've got to follow God's guidelines, his plans, and it's permanent no matter what. Why should I get married? There's a lot of people that think that. They're right in line with the disciples. Let's look at this for a moment, though. The original principles are in what I call, again, back at uh, the beginning, the creation account. Uh, and then secondly, uh, they're in what I call the first wedding performed by God. Here's Adam and Eve in the garden. God brings them together and then, and then basically says these words to them that are repeated four times in the Bible, leaving in what we call leaving and, and cleaving, becoming one. So it must be very, uh, very important. The first thing we note that uh, it was God who said that a man should leave his father and mother. It's God that said that two would become uh, one flesh. It's God that said they're no longer two but one. And it's God that said that whatever he's joined together, no one should separate. So therefore, no court of law or jurisdiction or the laws of Hawaii or anywhere else can change what God says. Whatever's going on in culture and people think it's, it's not relevant really to marriage, which is an institution that, that God placed here uh, on the earth. And obviously God meant it for all of us because he's saying to Adam and Eve to leave father and mother. Now, which exactly father and mother would they be leaving? <laughs> they didn't have any. So obviously he, this is meant for, for all of us, uh, uh, meant to be a uh, uh, for, throughout all time. Uh, the differences here are, are interesting. Uh, again, I've got four, four D's that I've stolen from David Hawking. I've, if you ever come to a wedding, you'll hear me preach on these, these four principles, but I like the four D's, so I, I may stick with them here. Uh, and the first one is there are differences between men uh, and women. Now, uh, I think for the most part, we've kind of figured that out. Although we've got a, we got a culture, at least a portion of the culture that says, oh no, that's not true. You know, and, and you, you get the whole thing that goes on. It was a lot more prevalent um, uh, in, the, in the 70s and part of the 80s. And I know many of you weren't born then, so praise God for that. You didn't have to live through it. But uh, still, there is that prevailing thought out there that somehow there are not differences. And there's vast differences. And if we don't understand them, we're going to have a hard time in our marriage relationships. Just uh, men and women talk differently, think differently, act differently, have different expectations. We communicate entirely uh, differently. Uh, when a uh, husband comes home at the end of the day and he's tired and he's had a tough day and he walks into the door and the furniture's all rearranged and he says, who moved the furniture? That's not good. See, because the wife has spent all day uh, taking care of that and, and doing that, trying to figure out what would be best for the home. So when he says that, what she hears is that uh, my time doesn't mean anything to you. You don't care about me. You think I'm worthless. And no, you just said, who moved the furniture? But what she hears is something completely different. See, guys have to learn to speak womanese if they're going to be able to get along in the context of, uh, of marriage and understand how this thing works. Kathy and I were uh, in Sports Authority about a week ago. And, uh, and she was looking for some, uh, some new walking shoes and stuff before we go on our trip. And uh, we're looking along, and, and, and I'm helping her, of course, pick out these shoes. You say, well, that could be tricky. How do you do that? You do it simply by this. When she picks some shoes out and says, what do you think? You say, I think those are very nice. That's, that's how you do it. <laughs> I think those are very nice, too, you know. Yeah, oh, these might be a little expensive. No, it's okay. Anyway, so that's... That's, that's how you do that. Now, there was a guy, uh, you know, the aisles are real high. The shoes are stacked up. So there's another couple over from me. And uh, I just was thinking, this guy does not know how to pick out shoes with his wife at all. Because he's saying, she, he's saying stuff, honey, look at these, man. This is a good deal. Look at the soles on these babies. You could probably get 100 miles out of these things, you know. This is really what you need here. I'm thinking, 
oh, this guy, you know, and she just goes, I'm not wearing shoes that look like, you know, whatever, in some description or whatever, football cleats or whatever. And, and then I hear something a, a little later, you know, about uh, something about, hey, if your car ever broke down, you don't want these babies on, you, you could walk a long ways in these, you know what I'm thinking? And this is just going on and on. And I'm thinking, how did this marriage, I don't know how old these people are. I only hear voices. I can't see them, you know, and I'm thinking... I, I hope they're newlyweds and this guy's going to kind of learn something, you know, uh, uh, about his wife very fast or this relationship is not going to last. And she's getting frustrated. I mean, you can hear what she's saying. Her voice is elevating now and they're, they're going back and forth. And, and finally, after about the fourth kind of um, idiotic comment that he makes about uh, lady shoes, uh, she says, well, this is the last time I take my big brother to pick out shoes. And I think... Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> okay, that, that changes everything here. Okay, this is just, uh, okay, they're not married. I didn't, at that point, I'd look around, I'd take a look. Okay, that's, <laughs> uh, so that's good. Uh, but again, God says there's, there's these differences. And if we don't understand them, we're going we're to have real problems. We're going to have, uh, 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 be uh, unable to communicate. The secondly, and I'll, I'll go through these things quickly, there's a departure from the parents. We're to leave so that we can cleave. So all relationships change. That means, uh, that means if parents hang on to their kids, put uh, financial strings and ties to them, then the parents are sinning because they're not allowing their kids to, to, to move on trying to keep control of them. On the other hand, the kids need to leave and make their relationship an absolute priority over mom and dad and all other, all other relationships. So everything changes at that point. There has to be the ability to leave uh, mother and father in order to cleave. Thirdly, there's a decision to be committed for life. The word united or cleave, uh, again, in the ancient world was used for stones a lot of stones were set without mortar, but when they were set with mortar to hold them together permanently uh, in a building, that's the word we have for united or cleave. It's meant to, be, meant to be permanent. And if you don't have this commitment going in, you're, you're, in, you're in trouble. I mean, this is, these are all basic things that have to be there as part of our relationship. And certainly there is everything in the world that is attacking this and pushing against it, as in Jesus' day as well. Uh, but again, the decision to be committed for life. Fourth, there's a dependency of each spouse upon the other, and the two will become one flesh. We're not supposed to live together as two independent people and share enough of things so that we can kind of get along. No, we're supposed to be completely dependent upon one another. And uh, if you've been married uh, for a while, you've probably uh, said to your wife, I hope you've said to your wife at some point in time, honey, I'd be lost without you. Because uh, it's, it's absolutely true. And, uh, uh, and they need to hear that. At the same time, hopefully they're, they're maybe saying that to you once in a while. A, an interdependence upon each other. I can't live without her. I can't live without him. We're inter... I just can't make it. We're one. That's God's plan. Uh, that's God's ideal and his design. Now I'm going to... Uh, read a, a couple of quotes today to you from John MacArthur's commentary. And this is another one, uh, a little lengthy, but uh, I think it's important. He says, God engineered men and women to complement, support, and give joy to each other through the mutual commitment of the marriage bond. It is by his divine hand that they are created to fulfill each other, encourage each other, strengthen each other, and produce children as a fruit of their love for each other. Whether they recognize it or not, every couple who has enjoyed the companionship, happiness, and fulfillment of marriage has experienced the miraculous blessing of God. There is no good thing in marriage that is not derived from Him. No child can be conceived by the procreative act of a man and a woman who is not first conceived by the creative act of God. God, God institutes marriage, and if we, if, we are, if we are enjoying it and blessed in following his plan and his desire, it's a miraculous blessing from God that he can take two people so different and bring us together and, and bring happiness to our, to our lives. And we should thank him and praise him for it. The fact that we're able to have children is because it's a blessing of God. Uh, it's it's uh, his ability. Children are a gift from God. That being said, 
MacArthur goes on and says this, very interesting, quote, every marriage and every child is a creation of God, and therefore divorce and abortion share this tragically evil common denominator. They kill a creation of God. To destroy a marriage is to destroy a creation of the almighty God. What therefore God has joined together, Jesus warned, let no man separate. So Jesus comes in and he kind of trumps these guys and they're saying, now here's the prevailing thought. Which side are you on, Shammai or Halal? Because either way, we, we've got you. Uh, and, uh, he said, and, and Jesus says, you know what? Yeah, Moses says this. You know what? But at the beginning, here was God's ideal. And if this is what's focused on, we're not really worried about the divorce thing because this is what's preeminent. This is what holds men and women together in marriage. So they come for the purpose of entrapping him. God's original principles are laid out. Notice he hasn't answered their question yet, really. He kind of comes back with a question himself. So third, they question him again, and Jesus gives only one provision for divorce, and that's in verse 7. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. So again, Jesus' question about Moses and his provision for divorce, they say Moses commanded. He says, no, uh, Moses permitted. And he reminds them this was not the case from the beginning. And, um, and again, this is a part of why remarriage and everything has been such a, a tough issue in the, uh, in the church today because most people have a tendency to take a cultural view of it instead of a, a, a biblical view of it. Uh, here, uh, again, it's, uh, uh, there was such a stigma, you know, I think uh, for a number of years in our culture, I can remember growing up and I, I uh, you know, in the era I grew up in was uh, uh, <coughs> Beaver and Wally lived down the street this way and Ozzie and Harriet were right around the corner. And uh, if you're not sure who that is, then watch Nickelodeon. It's in black and white and still on some time at night. But uh, in the 50s growing up, I mean, it was in the church growing up. I don't think you could even come to church if you're divorced. I don't think anyone ever came. I think if, if you got divorced, you're just out because there was such a stigma. It's just the way it was. I didn't know anyone. And if, and if somebody did come, it would be like, I mean, even outside of church, I could tell you the house in the street where the woman lived who was a divorcee. There was such a stigma. Why? Because there in the state of California, probably the same here in Hawaii. At that time, there was only one grounds for a divorce, one grounds only. You could not get a divorce unless somebody had, what was the one grounds? Adultery. That was the grounds for divorce. Some of you are a little younger, you didn't know that at the time, but, but that, that was, so it was a heavy thing. So if you got a divorce, it was like, was it her? Was it him? Because <laughs> I mean, that was the only grounds. So somebody, you know, Wonder who it was. And there was all the gossip, the rumors, the, there was a lot of stigma with it in society. And, and unfortunately, it carried right over in, into, the, into the church, uh, unfortunately. I, again, what happened later, then the laws got changed. And I remember when that happened is the laws got changed from that, that now you could get a divorce for irreconcilable differences. That's what people list on their divorce certificates now. Uh, again, the, the commonality is, what was the grounds in the Old Testament under the Mosaic law for getting a divorce? Irreconcilable differences. It's, it's what we, we really have today. So they come with Jesus with these, this question, but what did God command? And, and notice the, the option. If he sides with Rabbi Hillel uh, and his remarks and say that it's not for marital unfaithfulness, it's for any and every reason or irreconcilable differences. If Jesus si sides with Rabbi Halal, then they're, they're going to go, yeah, but didn't you say in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't you take the high road of morality and say that if a man even lusted after another woman, then uh, in, in his heart he's committed adultery? Didn't you say that if a man was angry towards someone else, that in his heart it's like he's already killed him? And now you're going to side with Rabbi Hillel in, in this instance? 
And don't you see the inconsistency here? I thought you were the high moral teacher taking us to a, a higher authority to show us what was, what was wrong in, in the law, that we could live by it and still sin, sin, by, uh, and sin to God. If he sides with uh, Rabbi uh, Shammai uh, and takes to what we would call the conservative position, then they're going to go, wait a minute, you hold his position, but aren't you the guy that dines and sits with sinners and tax collectors? And sinners is always in the noun form when it's used like this, and it means sexual sin, homosexuals, prostitutes, and so forth, that Jesus would frequent with, minister to, eat with, and so forth, trying to share the, the love of God with. So you're going to tell me that you're going to side with Rabbi Shammai, the conservative one, but look how you live. Don't you see the inconsistencies there? Either way, they, there's a gotcha. Uh, if he disagrees with Moses and what the Torah says, then they say, you're a blasphemer <laughs> and you cannot possibly be the Messiah. They thought this out a little bit, don't, don't you think? This is a good question for these guys trying to, trying to trap, uh, trap Jesus. Now, if Jesus said that, that uh, all divorce was wrong, that would be an option, then he's calling God a sinner. Because God divorced Israel, Jeremiah 3. Israel, again, was spiritually committing adultery by worshiping other idols, other gods, and so forth. So God tells the prophet Jeremiah to literally write out a certificate of divorcement and divorce Israel. So if all divorce is wrong, and that's what Jesus says, then he's saying that God is a sinner. And, then, and they still got him then. You can't be the Messiah. So again, what, is, what does Jesus do? Well, he says, you really misunderstand what Moses said all, all along. And the real issue is to go back to what God's plan was and see the permanence in marriage. And then this idea of divorce won't be a, uh, an issue in, any longer. But when pressed again, he does give a provision for divorce. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, 3B. One provision, one provision only. And he says it's marital unfaithfulness. So when, but when he does that, Jesus says, and I say unto you, some translations, NIV says, or I tell you. And when Jesus does that, he's claiming deity. Deity, why? Because he says, the word of God in Moses says this, but I say this. And what I'm saying is superseding the word of God. So either he's, he's God come in the flesh or he's a blasphemer. And, and don't think they don't know that when he, when he says that. So uh, he, he really takes it to a, a different note. And he says marital unfaithfulness, again, is the one provision that covers uh, any and all sexual sin outside the context of God's plan in, in marriage. So uh, the conclusion seems to be that the divorce in the New Testament is equivalent to death in the Old Testament. It's the one thing that frees the person to go on and, and, and be remarried. Therefore, if you follow Jesus's and what he says, and uh, you're married, your partner commits, is, is sexually unfaithful, and you divorce them, then you have gotten a righteous divorce. A righteous divorce. We see that in the New Testament. A guy named Joseph is engaged to Mary. Mary is with child. Joseph knows it's not, it's not mine. He's had no visitation from an angel yet. Yeah, good story. I uh, hope that works for you. But uh, what does it say about Joseph? It says, Joseph was going to put Mary away. It wasn't, they didn't, and by the first century, nobody was getting stoned when they broke the Mosaic law. So putting her away, we know, was to write her a certificate of divorce. And why does it say Joseph was going to do that? It says Joseph was going to do that because he was a righteous man. Very interesting. Have you ever thought about somebody getting a righteous divorce before? You can understand that this is a, this is a little different than, than a lot of the Christianese culturalism of, of America and how they view, that goes all the way back to some of our legal books and how people viewed divorce at one time. And tremendous guilt, tremendous condemna condemnation associated with it. It's not as bad anymore. Why? Because they understand biblical truth now? No, it's because <laughs> culture's just become very lax in this area. It's okay for people to get a divorce for any and every reason. It's, it's okay. So in some ways, it's made it easier within the church for folks that are divorced and remarried or divorced and single and, and so forth. It's made it a little easier, people a little more gracious. I don't think it's because they, they understand what Jesus said here, though, which is what 
our view should be, yeah, obviously. So again, Jesus did not teach that the offended mate had to get a divorce. No, he says it was permitted uh, at that point in time. And again, why was there divorce in, in Moses' day? Jesus says it was because of the adultery. No, he says it was because of the hardness of their hearts. Uh, it, was, uh, it was what was going on in their hearts that led to the divorce. Uh, it wasn't because of sexual sin. Because if somebody committed sexual sin, eh, they were killed. So when it comes to why did Moses permit divorce? It was because there was something that had really gone wrong in, in people's hearts in the context of marriage. And I want to give you a, a couple of particulars to help us understand that. Hebrews here, I, I, you know, I believe it's the Apostle Paul writing Hebrews 3, 7. And I've got the verse for you. It says, so as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert. So what does it mean to harden our hearts? It means you are no longer listening to God's voice. Why do people get divorced according to Jesus? It's because of the hardness of their hearts. They no longer listen to the Lord. Go their own way. Do their own thing. There's a second part of this in verse 13, continuing in chapter 3. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin is deceitful. Why do people get divorced, even Christians today? It's because we would say they're not following God's ideal in his blueprint and understand the concept of permanence. What happens is their hearts become hardened because they're not really listening to the Lord anymore and because of sin's deceitfulness that comes in. Let me tell you one, pride. That's a sin. You think it has anything to do with how people get along? No, you said this. No, I didn't say that. I said that. You know, when there's arguments, nobody's going, well, I just really humble submit to you, honey, that I disagree with you. No. I mean, when these arguments are going, when things are happening, when somebody uses the divorce word in the middle of argument, what steps up? My pride. No, you're not. I'm going to divorce you. No, you're And it just, the whole thing ratchets up. If you want to see real drama, go to a divorce court. It's not, it's not a, a pleasant thing. And, uh, and so sin's deceitfulness come in. So all of us should be warned of that if, if, we're, if we're married. We need to be very careful. We understand that there's, there's differences uh, that I need to depart from all the priority of all other relationships, uh, that, that God has a purpose for us coming together and making us one, and, and he will, uh, that every marriage is really a miracle of God. It can be blessed by God. At the same time, my heart can become hard pretty, pretty easily actually with the things in the world and the things that go on and everything that's against uh, marriage. So the Pharisees, again, tested for the purpose of entrapping him. Uh, Jesus lays out God's original principle, and then he gives only one provision for divorce. And then fourthly, Jesus' statement about the permanence of marriage is hard for the disciples to accept. Verse 10, uh, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, <laughs> it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they are born that way. Others were made that way by men. And others have, been re have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. So a couple things about this, and this is really for the, the singles that are, that are in, the, uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, if marriage is permanent, then the disciples think it would be better to be single because again they had bought into the culture of the day the religious culture but the culture of the day that said if it doesn't work out I can always get a divorce I'll get married but if things get tough I mean you know there's no you know you know it's like it's very acceptable we'll just we'll give it a shot see if it'll work out kind of a thing and the disciples saying you're telling me that no matter what, I have to stick it out all the way to the end until death do us apart? And Jesus is saying, exactly. And there's only one provision for, uh, for, for getting, getting out of that. And they're like, well, that's better not to be married then. It's better not to be married. So secondly, uh, here it says, if marriage is permanent, then it's important to understand what it means to be single. And Jesus gives a couple of examples. And by the way, the word eunuch just means you're single. That's, that's all. I mean, there's a, there's a connotation in the ancient world and stuff, but it just means you're single. So he gives three different types of, of singles. I thought, you know, that'd be good if we want to be really biblical 
And we're going to start like a singles ministry. We could call it the Unix. Unix meeting, uh, you know, Tuesday night, 730. Probably won't go over real big. But, uh, 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 but it just means singles. So uh, what does he say about singles? Well, uh, one, um, he says, uh, singles who cannot accept the teaching about marriage stay single. If you, can't, if you can't go into it and realize that men and women are different, you know, I have to leave all my other relationships behind. This is going to become the priority. And, uh, and I'm, I am making a commitment for, for a lifetime. I'm going to live interdependent upon that other person. Jesus, if you can't accept that and buy into that, stay single. Just stay single. Don't, don't, don't get married. That's what he says. Secondly, he says some people from birth... Uh, should not be uh, be married. There's two views on, on this. Uh, some people would say that um, uh, some people, because of birth, physical problems, emotional problems in birth, should not get married. That, that's one view, and I can see a validity in that. I really think primarily, though, he's talking about people that just really have the gift of singleness. Uh, they're okay with it. <laughs> they're okay. They don't have to be married. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, the Apostle Paul is a great uh, uh, example of that. In 1 Corinthians, talk about the advantages of being single in terms of being able to serve the Lord. You don't have the, uh, have the, the restraints. You know, if uh, God calls you to, to the mission field, you know, it's, it's a lot easier just pack your one suitcase and go versus if you have a whole family. Uh, I'll give you an example. Our, our missionaries, Vaughn and Isabel, when, they, uh, when Vaughn was able to, uh, after, again, they were in Pakistan for a, a number of years, uh, and then, and then the, the door kind of closed on the ministry there after about uh, uh, six years or so, and they were uh, back on the mainland and uh, training missionaries, working in a missions training school, going in and out of Pakistan with uh, teams for uh, maybe three, six months at a time. And then uh, when the, uh, the Taliban of course, was uh, driven out uh, by our, our, our military out of Afghanistan. Vaughn had enough contacts. He was on one of those first planes going uh, into, the, into the country right away with a lot of the uh, other uh, NGOs and people doing uh, emergency kind of medical stuff and everything. Uh, he was able to get in there and uh, build up a relationship with the, uh, the guy that became the, uh, the minister of education under Karzai, was able to form his own non-government organization, get his own visas and all that. And they've got a, a a group of like 22 that are on the ground uh, in the country today running, uh, <laughs> don't put this on the radio, <laughs> it just occurred to me, too many, too many names right there, too much information, uh, but they, they're, they're, uh, they're in there and some tremendous things are happening, but at a point in time, uh, the, that guy said to Vaughn, who was leaving family behind, going in and out of the country for a couple of months at a time, said, we need you here full time. We need you here full time. This thing is happening. It's expanding. This is going back a couple of years ago. Uh, remind you, there's still a little war going on over there. And it was, it was even a little dicier a couple of years ago. And the guy's saying, if you want this thing to continue, we need you here full time. The only way he could be there full time was to take his wife and his three kids and, and to uh, Kabul live there and, uh, and uh, continue the business operations of, of the ministry that they do there. Was that harder because he was married? Was that a harder decision? That'd be an easy decision. I can just tell you, it was an easy decision for him if he's single. He's there. But with, uh, you know, wife and kids, it might have made it more difficult. So we prayed, people prayed, and, and uh, he decided to go, and we helped him financially, and they went, and they, they were there for, for a couple of, couple of years with his family there, and ministry got going. Everything happened. He was eventually able to move back out of the country. But it's just a lot easier. Some people have the gift uh, of singleness. Why, why am I going on of this? Because there's kind of a concept that, that uh, sometimes uh, you're more spiritual if you, you're married and have kids. You know, then you have the ideal Christian home or whatever. And Jesus says, that's not true. And Paul says, that's not true either. Uh, he says, in fact, from birth, from the beginning in God's plan, you should pray about whether you should be married or not because there are folks that God intends to be single and he's got uh, reasons and, uh, and purposes for that. Three, some have been made that way by men. And unfortunately, that was done in the, uh, the ancient world, and that's our usual connotation that goes with the idea of being a eunuch. And four, some are single by commitment. And, and again, that uh, really falls into the example we've just gone through. There's a lot of uh, uh, folks that are on the mission field that we've met and know that are, that are single, and they could not be there if they were married. It's just 
there, there's too much there's too much drama to bring a family into where where they're at and uh, and so forth. So uh, again, in this whole discussion of um, uh, you know divorce, uh, God's plan for marriage, I just find it interesting that Jesus interjects this information, important information that really ought to help guide uh, uh, singles in this whole area as well. And uh, and of course Matthew then uh, arranging information. Uh, not chronologically, but topically, very interesting then, uh, brings in a fifth dimension here. Jesus always has time for parents who want prayer. We see that in verses 13 to 15. Then the little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who, were brought, who uh, brought them. Uh, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. So two things very importantly, the disciples rebuked the parents, bringing their children to Jesus. And uh, just in their defense a little bit, Jesus has said he's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's on his way to the cross. They've moved down into this area of Judea where they're under Herod's jurisdiction. He's just had this big run-in with the Pharisees. They're not sure which way this thing is going to go. But, if, but uh, one thing's for sure is that this is not a good time to bother Jesus with a bunch of kids. Uh, and this was a common practice, especially on the Day of uh, Atonement, uh, to bring the kids uh, to a rabbi and have him place his hands on them or hold them and pray for them. And that, we follow that example in terms of uh, baby dedications. But the disciples are basically saying to the parents, not now. You, you don't understand the dynamics of, of what is taking place here. Now, that's important to understand, to realize then Jesus' response where he says, no, 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 uh, I, am, I, I don't care what's going on. Uh, I'm, parents want me to pray for their kids, bring them in. For the kingdom of heaven is such as these. No matter what kind of drama we might be going under, uh, whatever's going on in our lives, it's like God says, you can always come to me. And again, context is marriage, uh, family, children, you can always come to me and, uh, and, I'll, and, and meet with me. Uh, that door is, is always open. And, and I think that that's why, why uh, Matthew places this little incident with the kids in this, this context. I, I want to uh, read again a, a final quote from, uh, from John MacArthur and tell a little story that he told that I thought was good. Uh, and then make a few closing re remarks because we still need to uh, address the issue, though we did in, uh, in Matthew 5 as well. Uh, what do the folks do that didn't have a righteous divorce? You know, and uh, uh, don't squirm too long. You know, there's, there's grace here, and we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. Uh, but again, uh, John MacArthur says this in his uh, uh, New Testament commentary in Matthew. Romance can be a beautiful part of marriage that lasts even through old age. But romantic feelings cannot be the basis for a sound and enduring marriage because they are largely composed, composed of pleasant sensations towards the other person that are easily subject to change. A sound marriage is based on permanent, unconditional commitment to one spouse, even if romantic feelings flicker or are extinguished altogether. If romantic feelings are the basis of a marriage, when a spouse begins to lose attractiveness, the other attention is uh, turn towards someone else who is more promising and exciting. When romantic, one romantic fling after another is pursued, emotional burnout is inevitable. Such a superficial relationship cannot last long and never achieves the expected fulfillment. Each successive failure brings less satisfaction and more disappointment, disillusionment, emptiness. The collective results as seen so dramatically and tragically in modern society is a generation of disoriented, lonely, isolated, untrustworthy, untrusting, and emotionally bankrupt misfits looking for the next arousing sensation. Uh, and, and then at this point, he tells the story of a, of a pastor, of a minister who's been married for 50 years, and his wife is ill, and, and she uh, dies and goes to be with the Lord. And, and he's at the funeral, and he's walking away uh, with one of his kids. Uh, and, he, and he says to him, uh, then he says, this is a good day. This is a wonderful day. And then his son asked him, well, why would you say that, Dad? He says, well, I know that she's with the Lord. And uh, I'm glad she went first. That's the way I wanted it to be. Because I didn't want her to, to have the grief of burying me and then having to live alone. So it was a good day. And his point is, that's an example of love. 
that, that, that goes uh, all, all the way. That's, that's a permanence that, that he's talking about. And then he says, <laughs> this guy had the opportunity to speak in front of a women's group, which he said was non-Christians. And so there's a few feminists, more than a few feminists in the audience, he said. And they asked him about this, uh, this incident. Uh, and and he, says, he says, listen, anybody who knows the meaning of true love always wants the other person to go first. Because they don't want them to endure the pain and the sorrow and the anxiety and the loneliness of burying the one that they've loved. I dare say that the modern romantic relationship that they try to pass for love is a far cry from that kind of feeling and that kind of reality. And uh, obviously he was, he was right. Uh, again, they bring up the issue of divorce and Jesus says, you know what? That's not the issue. The issue is God's plan for marriage and the permanence of marriage and if we'll follow it how what a blessing it, it can be so again divorce is in and of itself it's not a sin it's not sinful uh, Jesus is concerned for the reason for divorce uh, if you're divorced before, before you became a believer then you're just single you're just a believer all things have passed away all things have become new you're a new creature in Christ if you've got a divorce as a believer then again, Jesus is concerned about that reason. It could be that it was a righteous divorce. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and you can take assurance of that. Uh, if it wasn't, uh, uh, maybe it was, quote, irreconcilable differences, or maybe you were the offending party <laughs> in, the, in the adultery. Uh, well, well, what do you do then? Well, we're going to take you out back, give you a few lashes and straighten this thing out. No. God, God doesn't do that. He's concerned about our hearts. Three out of four people that get a divorce get another one and another one. Why? Because they've never really come before God, gotten their heart right before God, seen their own sin, admitted their own sin, asked to be forgiven and be cleansed. And once they have, they are. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, and again, unfortunately, in the church, in the church, We've basically developed our theology that moves and sways on what society says or thinks over this subject. And I don't think we've ever really thought it through, through biblically. What's the emphasis? The permanence of marriage. Uh, but at the same time, there is such a thing as a righteous divorce, and there's grace when, when there's not. And when there's not, hey, you ask God's forgiveness you get it right in your own heart, your own mind, so that it doesn't repeat. And by the way, the statistics where, where a person is divorced and then they come into a personal relationship with, with Christ and they have it right in their mind, the chances of them staying together are, are like very high, 80, 90% or whatever. They, they, uh, they go off, off the charts. 